Hey everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's October 19th, 2022. My name's Eric Osterman and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. If you're struggling with what it takes to operate successfully in AWS, you're not alone. The good news is that Cloud Posse has helped companies just like yours turn things around. We have a proven repeatable process that we'd like to share with you. If you're curious to learn more, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz. Just answer a few quick questions and you can book a call with me directly. For those of you new to the call, the format's very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. Our call today is recorded. We'll automatically post a recording of the session to our YouTube channel. So if you enjoy the content and want to support what we do, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. Just head over to youtube.com slash cloud posse. Again, youtube.com slash cloud posse. So let's uh, jump into some announcements today. Uh, first one is uh, cloud posse has, uh, I'm going to say finally, uh, released an ECS cluster module. Um, for the longest time, we've been mostly focused on just Fargate and to deploy and Fargate cluster is like one resource. Well, if you want to start doing a little bit more with ECS and support the different types of capacity providers, there's a little bit more involved uh, to implementing it. So we've implemented a fully flushed out, uh, tested ECS cluster uh, module that we're using in our components. And that those um, and it supports and all the different auto scaling uh, capabilities of the various um, capacity providers. So uh, worth checking out if you are using ECS and not happy with the current solution. Any questions on that before moving on? Another small announcement is. Um, We've been debating for an embarrassingly long time. Uh, I don't know when the template provider was deprecated, like a year and a half ago or two years ago, but uh, we decided, screw it, let's just do it. We forked it. A lot of other people have done it. There are other forks out there. We just wanted to trust our own fork. Um, the template provider is still useful because it provides the ability to do string level templates. And string templates are kind of nice if, you have a, a variable input and you want to change some behavior and using template files is one option, but eh, those template files are like, if you have a one line template file, it doesn't feel quite right. I think we also have some other uh, examples. I forget where we're using basically allowing the, the user to specify the template as a variable is a pretty convenient pattern that we've used. So we released uh, this and it's cross compiled for every architecture. So that way, um, you know, you're, you're not blocked. The problem with the official deprecated template provider is they stopped providing any updates, they archived it, and it doesn't have support for M1. So that limits the value for most developers these days developing on Macs. Cool. Any questions on this and why, why it's needed? Okay, so next announcement is uh, GitHub has finally introduced some more fine-grained access controls for personal access tokens. One of my pet peeves for the longest time has been that they don't restrict to the repository. So it's, uh, you know, if you are a contractor, for example, who has access to a dozen organizations or more, uh, and have some personal access tokens, those tokens are dangerous. So with this announcement, those tokens can now be, first of all, scoped uh, much better. So with read-only permissions, uh, for example, or list-only. And then the other uh, capability is that they can be restricted to a particular repository. Organizations can also set policies on what kinds of personal access tokens can uh, be created, uh, and that makes it more secure. What still really sucks about this whole model, Matt Calhoun highlighted it or reminded me about it today, is that GitHub's still not taking seriously the fact that 
we need service accounts that sometimes these things aren't tied to humans. And yes, we can create a bot account. That is a good stopgap measure we've had to use for the last 15 years. But maybe that there's you know so many of these bot accounts, we can start getting uh, some service accounts or maybe the bot accounts are just really good for the GitHub metrics, I don't know. So uh, anyone else check out this announcement, have things to highlight? Some people I said that uh, they, it was a bit annoying that it was limiting to one year, but yeah, I guess yeah. it's a good practice. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I think one of the other things is that it's um, that the personal access tokens that you generate here are, I, I don't believe they work cross organization. Hmm. I think you, you have to actually, because I think each, uh, I think it says something in here about the. That would make uh, sense because organizations can set policies. So. Right. Yeah. So I think there's like, if, if for an example, like you were, you're creating a bot user and you were retrieving code from your own, your own org, and then you also had access to something in another org and you use that, you want to use that same uh, pat for that. I don't think you can do that. I think you need like a separate, you know, a separate um, token to do that. But I'd have to verify that. Okay, makes sense. I, th I think that's the case. I think this is rad too. I love this. Uh, organization owners can now block classic personal access tokens, um, having greater, therefore, you know, reducing the likelihood that uh, sensitive uh, tokens are um, released. So next announcement would be just uh, so, sorry sorry just before you carry on there um eric um <clears throat> just on the fine-grained access control um one of the concepts that i've been toying around with is using like our um oidc slash saml and then basically have github authoring so have single sign-on essentially. So our internal bots would be provisioned against our own, um, like Okta or Auth0, and then use single sign-on against um, GitHub. I didn't follow Matt. Did you... With the with the with the um, problem statement that you said with like. GitHub not supporting bot accounts natively. Yeah. Um, instead of in, in, instead of creating a myriad of users, you've yeah. got your GitHub org that's basically um, paired with your SSO provider. So mm -hmm. your bot accounts can do an internal authentication against your SSO, and then through the SSO, get access to your GitHub. Yeah. You, you've just shifted the you've just shifted the problem left or whatever. So instead of creating the bot users in GitHub, you're creating the bot users in your directory, whatever the source directory yes. is, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's the same. It's the same issue though. You have to create a set of accounts essentially that isn't like that isn't actually a user. You have to create a user account for it. Like rather than GitHub natively supporting something like deploy keys, but that, that would work for like CI and cross repo, you know, something along those lines where you would be able to set policy around them, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, you're, pro, you're I'm not arguing what you've done works and, but I'm, I also don't think that that's necessarily like the best solution because you're still creating a quote unquote user account for something that isn't actually a user. Yeah, service. Right. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, I mean, it's just we generally have a little bit more acceptance to creating service accounts or unnamed user accounts um, within our existing structure, which makes it a little bit easier to get away with than trying to like 
yeah. create user yep. create users on GitHub. No, it seems to make yep. sense. Then you can you know tag them however you need to uh, in your management system uh, that these are it bot is. accounts and so forth, which is harder. Yeah, yeah and yeah, I said, but it, it also. It, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, Kara. I, I was only going to say that it also makes it a little bit more of a difficult story when you don't control the the access. For example, like Cloud Posse, we we connect to you know dozens of customer you know GitHub organizations, and GitHub currently only supports one single like single sign on solution provider for your repo, so they don't have a way to like delegate you know, trust multiple IDPs. So yes. we're, we're reduced to not being able to use single sign-on when we connect to other, you know, other GitHub organizations. And there are, there are other than consulting organizations, there are lots of other reasons why that scenario exists in the world too. So it's harder when you don't control the entire thing end to end either. So yeah, that, but, but definitely another, sure. another approach. Surely that problem must be solved because like if I go to Circle CI as an example, I mean, I can tell Circle CI, okay, you can authenticate my Circle CI tenant to my GitHub org and or multiple GitHub orgs that I own. Yeah, but that's actually using your personal credentials to do that. That's kind of the whole, that's kind of my gotcha. whole argument. So Not when you, you're account. logged into GitHub and then it's it's relying on Alan's you know actual user account to be able to do that rather than a service account that you specifically provisioned to give access to you know other services as an example. Yeah. Okay. No worries. I, I got you. Yeah. Cool. I'm uh, moving on. Uh, the next announcement uh, caught my eye were uh, design improvements for GitHub Actions navigation. Um, they are trying to improve. Um, you know, navigating complex workflows and the steps. To me, this is like, you know, lipstick on a pig a little bit. We, uh, what we really want is just a better way to view workflows and build statuses across an organization with hundreds of repositories. Uh, these days, every organization that is doing anything serious with GitHub Actions uh, has already built some other workaround. They're sending the telemetry to Prometheus. They're sending it to Datadog. They're doing reports there. And that's still probably you know, a good idea to do. I think though for users, it would be nice to have some way to uh, interact with uh, workflows. The other interesting thing that we're struggling with uh, or grappling with at Cloud Posse is how to leverage environments for large mono repos where it's not just dev, uh, you know, staging and production and preview. This works because this is not a mono repo. This is just a microservice, single service repo. But what if you had uh, literally, you know, three dozen services inside this repo with ten different environments or something? It gets unwieldy to define environments for that number of services in the repo and navigating it and viewing it. Uh, and yet, my, and yet, uh, mono repos are a very common pattern in engineering and uh, arguably growing in popularity to some degree. So I'd like to see a solution for that. Has anyone dealt with this or frustrated with it? Just curious. I'm frustrated with it as you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have a solution. Yeah. Actually, I guess what I meant to do was click here. And then I, I guess like a very old school traditional solution would be to leverage like you have your make file there is to leverage different components or different services that have different platforms from within your make file make your make file like the common language and then when you like containerize it because all of these things get built by containers you just need to make sure that all of the elaborate tool set is in your container no, but that's the easy the, part the, the don't, don't come crying when you're sitting with a 30 gig container that you can't yeah. launch anywhere because Docker times up. No, no, that's not the problem. Like building multiple containers or whatever in a uh, mono repo, that's no problem. We do that all the time. I'm, I, I was unclear. Uh, you see this drop down here for show environment. Yep. Imagine if you have literally 300 environments because it's 
30 services times 10 environments. So you have 300 environments. Uh, this UX just doesn't scale for uh, mono repo. Uh, so it's a UX problem that we're highlighting. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you've used this, Alan, but that, so that environment thing is like devs preview staging and prod are all um, like defined by us. They're all user defined in names. Yep. They're not like any sort of canonical thing. So even if you had, for example, a very busy like web application and you had a lot of users working on it and you had 20 pull requests open at the same time and each pull each preview environment is a is its own environment essentially yeah. um this gets unwieldy because you see it in here yeah. so basically the idea is that every place you deploy to if you're using so the the idea is that if you start to leverage GitHub Actions to do the 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 D part of continuous deployment of of CD, um, having a way to track those deployments. This is their visualization for that. Um, yet the user experience is that they just give you this gigantic list of environments, and you have to like scroll through it basically to find the environment that you're you're looking for. There's no better like UX around you know how you can visualize environments in here it's not the actual steps that are taking place to build and deploy a, an environment that we're having yeah, a problem with it's the vis the visualization of the status of each of those environments basically yeah. which was why we were a little bit we were excited when we <clears> saw this announcement and then we read into the details and oh okay never mind <laughs> baby right. steps. Oh, sorry go on. i was just saying baby steps. eventually i'm sure Oh, uh, RB, you're cutting out. We can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? I uh, have probably, but as soon as you start saying something I wanted to hear, then it cuts out. <laughs> oh no, that's not good for the demo. Yeah, no, it sounds good right now. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, fingers crossed. All right, all right. Thanks. So we get it. We're getting closer here. So um, the last announcement. Um, is Docker Hub is raising the prices quite uh, significantly here. Uh, Docker business subscriptions will go from three dollars to uh, twenty four dollars uh, per seat. Oh, it's up by three dollars. Oh, 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 up by three. Oh, okay, my bad. you thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and then uh, go up by two dollars for the team subscriptions, and the team subscriptions uh, will be limited to a hundred seats, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like what almost fifteen percent increase on both. Yeah, we see that happening mm -hmm. across a lot of SaaS services. A, a question, maybe for you, Eric, um, and and this is purely based of your experience with your current uh, customer base. Yeah, how many people actually do end up using Docker Hub? I'd much rather have my repos private in ECS and. Yeah leverage ec i mean ecr and leverage yeah. ecr then now having to worry about yet another service yeah uh i guess that you're fair to ask especially since i said docker hub basically no one uses docker hub these days if they're on aws amongst our customers they're all using ecr especially for all the reasons you said uh the the kicker is they still do provide a pretty good uh developer experience for docker desktop and uh, you know, a little bit entrenched in that area. Uh, the alternatives haven't yet come up too often, I'll be honest, amongst our customers. Yet, I think a lot of our customers are subject to the, um, you know, uh, licensed version of the product. So uh, anyone else have something to add to that one? The only thing I would say is that, um, if customers are building product that is uh, deployed uh, deployed by a Docker image, or you know, have some large things that they've open sourced or whatever, they're often using Docker Hub still um, to do that. At least I've seen that. You know, if you you actually are like distributing Docker images yes, to other yes, people. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, we had this discussion just internally, like for our Atmos tool, yeah. 
Like, I think it is still, it still makes a lot of sense if you are a open source company or a product company and you want to have uh, is the easiest distribution possible for that product. Uh, it makes sense probably to stick it on Docker Hub. Then again, it's public, so you don't have to pay for it. Uh, um, I, uh, if it's open source, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it's product, not necessarily the case, yeah. but yeah. Sure. And also the other thing comes into play where, uh, if you're consuming a lot of things on Docker, you also get rate limited these days True. to True. authenticate to pay for that as well. So, so which is why a lot of open source folks have moved to ECR public. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is a lot more friendlier with bandwidth. Yeah. I a lot of Kubernetes images were only in Docker Hub and it was really, really painful when they added the rate limits because yeah. Oh, not only you cannot pull this image that you need for every single node when you're scaling up. Yeah. No, it's true. And I think so. I think the argument I made is a dying one. Uh, better just to pick something like ECR Public or one of the many other ones. So, last yeah. one. Yeah. Go. On. So, sorry, I've seen more and more, especially on the Kubernetes side, I've seen more and more um, public images pointing towards uh, Google Container Registry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I've also seen people starting to leverage more like the public uh, or the open source GitLab um, and using GitLab's um, embedded registry as well. Interesting. I haven't seen that one as much, but the other one I have seen definitely. So the next announcement was just something that caught my eye. Um, uh, because I, I was a, a fan of MemSQL back in the day uh, when they had just launched and kind of revolutionized high performance uh, MySQL uh, by you know, basically reinventing the database and speaking the same wire protocol. Well, the founders of that have gone on now uh, and started their next company, <laughs> Serverless Postgres. Uh, so high performance serverless Postgres that uh, scales uh, based on demand, self-managed. Now, not immediately exciting to me, uh, you know, since we generally just prefer to deploy RDS Aurora and move on and with our day. But there was one thing that was really awesome uh, feature of this that I thought, which was branching. So how awesome uh, is it, it like if you can uh, just branch a database at a, a particular point for like uh, ephemeral preview environments or things like that. Um, and seeing that in the database made a lot of sense to me. So this is a built-in feature of uh, this product that they're building. Uh, more than that, I'm not sure. Oh, looks like there is a, ah, it's open source. Beautiful. Um, have you seen yeah. Superbase, which tries something similar? It's also based off uh, Postgres. Superbase? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, Firebase alternative. Not the same market, though. Yeah. I mean, they do have a database component to it, but this is this is also trying to tackle off and mm. yeah, know, running serverless functions and you know. A In bunch theory, of you could run like Superbase Mario. on Neon. Like Neon is just replacing the backend of Postgres. So. Gotcha. Cool. Well, that takes us to the last part here. Um, a little different, but we were announcing, there's been a lot of requests uh, to get a, a demo of um, Atmos. Uh, RB on the call is going to uh, give a demo of that. I just wanted to do a very rough run through uh, on some uh, draft slides I have. Also would like to get any feedback on that later on uh, from the audience, like what's not clear and so forth. So. So uh, the, the presentation today is going to be on Atmos. Um, we are pitching Atmos as a way of basically scaling the, your usage of Terraform, both through workflows and configuration. And the reason why this is important is because businesses today succeed because of their process. These are processes from how your website work, how you do checkout, how you do customer service, but also how you do infrastructure as code. So those processes are captured through workflows. And for us, those workflows uh, will be giving teams superpowers. The best workflows can be run by anyone, anywhere. They're easily understood and ensure that less mistakes are made. Workflows are written down and because they're written down, they're easily iterated on and optimized. 
So the tool we're going to show you today is Atmos, and it's basically a workflow automation tool. It's how you capture that. We created it because as a DevOps accelerator, we're working with so many different customers that have unique needs and constantly testing our ability to solve them. Fortunately, it's been going pretty well. So with so many tools out there today, Terragrunt, Terramate, Terraspace, um, you know, Atmos now, Make, Rake, um, and your homegrown bash scripts, why do we need another tool like Atmos? So the problems we had to solve is why we built the tool. So we, we needed to support many different teams concurrently using the tool and trying to reuse as much configuration as possible. We needed a way to automate those deliverables that we are providing to the customer. So the customers need to be able to reproduce whatever we create. And we are a business ourselves. So we needed to codify our processes, our systems, well enough that somebody else could do that. And we need to be able to handle all these yet unknown requirements. Very recently, uh, we were, were working with a very large financial institution and uh, they needed certain levels of policy control, which we didn't support. But fortunately, since you know, we picked YAML, that was a really easy thing to add. And now Atmos supports OPA and JSON schema. So at its heart, Atmos is this tool that enables hierarchical configurations. This reduces the complexity because you don't have so much configuration all over the place. They're basically roots of configurations, and then you just inherit those configurations wherever you need them. This helps keep those configurations dry. And then we implemented this command that allows us to run those workflows anywhere. So for example, you could be running the workflows through GitHub Actions, but if you did the whole solution in GitHub Actions, you could only ever run it in GitHub Actions. How does somebody run that same workflow locally for development? We wanted a tool that allowed us to do that anywhere. And we also recognize that we don't just use Terraform. We use Helm file, we use the AWS CLI, we use kubectl, we use lots of other tools. So we didn't want to build a solution that only worked with Terraform, which is how most of the other tools work. So Atmos at its heart is just a single binary. It's been cross compiled for every architecture. So it runs everywhere. The other thing that you'll notice in the demo today is that we use YAML. YAML is uh, a very practical language. Everyone knows it. Some, some people hate it, but it's here to stay. It's the dominant language you know, of uh, cloud uh, platforms today, uh, namely like Kubernetes and um, every build automation system out there. So it's extensible, uh, meaning you can do what you want with that markup language, which is what we've done. And we built a declarative DSL on top of it. What we've added is this concept of importing configurations, inheriting configurations. We can even inherit from multiple places. Uh, we can deep merge those configurations. And recently we just added the ability to have policies on those configurations. So since we've chosen YAML, it's not tied to any tool and every single language can read and write it uh, or generate it, for example. And YAML supports anchors. So guardrails is the other thing we realized uh, is needed. So when you have all this configuration all over the place, it gets hard to enforce standards, especially the more people that are working on it. If you don't have some policy controls on it, you can't set those standards. There are many tools that do policy enforcement on Terraform, but they are a little bit shifted right in our opinion. They are evaluating that plan. And that means you've had to go through this whole process before they, that evaluation kicks in. Or maybe there's some validation on the Terraform code itself that makes sure that you're you know, following best practices on security groups and so forth. That's great. You don't stop doing that. But there's also a level of policy enforcement on the configuration itself. Can we deploy, are we allowed to deploy two VPCs in the same component, uh, or sorry, in the same account? Maybe we should catch that earlier than going all the way through to the plan phase. So by allowing us to have policies on the configuration, we're able to catch problems with the configuration much sooner to make the experience better for the developers. 
So uh, we're going to show you what that inheritance looks like today. Uh, we're going to show you how you can organize the configurations into logical groups and then define things so they can be reused. And um, then we're going to show how Atmos recognizes that a per general purpose tool like GitHub Actions general purpose can make it hard to solve some specialized use cases. That's why specialized tools exist. So we've implemented some opinionated workflows, how we work with Terraform, how we work with Helm file uh, that ship with Atmos. So um, I'm gonna skip some of these in the interest of time, I think. Um, I wanna make sure we have enough to go over all the demo. Uh, RB, how much time do you need to do the demo? Um, maybe 10 minutes. But you know, I, I often undershoot, so maybe maybe 15 or 20. All right. I'm just gonna take, I guess, five minutes and zip through the rest of this. So the problem that we've found with Terraform by itself is that GitOps, first of all, is non-trivial when you're working with Terraform. Terraform by itself is not dry. That's why tools like Terragun exist. And uh, th there was a Terra TerraPlate just came out, some templating uh, solution. Terraliths are this thing where you have very large Terraform root modules because you're relying on Terraform to compute the whole graph and solve dependencies and things like that. That is good, except for it runs into a big problem is that your blast radius becomes massive and brittle and time consuming. Back in the day, we've had um, you know, Terraliths that take two hours to run a Terraform plan. That's horrible. You can't have that. And the blast, and it's scary. Nobody wants to touch it. So you want to break your Terraform state into smaller pieces. But when you do, you run into a whole new problem. Terraform isn't really helping you solve the problem of having lots of root modules and the dependencies between those. Um, so that's uh, part of the problems that we're trying to solve uh, with it. So you're going to hear some terms thrown around today. You're going to hear this term called components. Components are what we call Terraform root modules. They're opinionated, but they're vanilla Terraform. So this is not requiring you know, to put in some vendor extensions into Terraform root modules. It's just by convention, if you follow how we do root modules, they become very reusable. They become building blocks of your organization. Child modules are you know, our whole Cloud Posse ecosystem. The 200 plus Terraform modules we have on our GitHub, that's, uh, those are called child modules. Stacks, this is a massively overloaded term. We understand it, but there's a shortage of vocabulary in our industry that's not. So a stack for us, that means everything that you deploy uh, together as a logical unit, kind of. But it's not necessarily one Terraform root module. So many vendors, many companies think of a stack as just one Terraform root module. But we didn't think about it that way because we should be breaking our root modules into multiple root modules and combining those as a stack that we deploy. And catalogs, these are th this concept of reusable configuration. Your team as a platform team will be creating reusable configurations that then any other team member can just import and reuse anytime they wanna do it. So uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, some of the things that, you know, you get with uh, using our tooling is, um, you know, you get to stick with vanilla uh, Terraform code. Uh, you can easily deploy uh, your stacks across any number of regions, across any number of accounts, and you can generate the YAML configurations um, automatically. For example, with cookie cutter, if you wanted to do it that way, or maybe some integration you have with service now, somebody goes through your corporate enterprise process and requests a service that could result in just a YAML config being created. Not a single line of Terraform was harmed in the process. So what's it look like? Well, you're gonna see in the demo how we organize our infrastructure. This is an oversimplification of it, but the idea is that we don't enforce a convention on you. That's the beautiful thing here. You can use whatever conventions make sense for you as you develop an opinion for it. Here are some conventions we've adopted because through our experience, they make a lot of sense. So there's this one concept of like a catalog where you'll have reusable configurations. So you'll have a baseline for a VPC, a baseline for an EKS cluster, a baseline for ACM and ECR and so forth. So anytime you need those, you just import them. Then we have this concept of mix-ins. This is where you have configuration that 
you can use to very easily alter the behavior of some other configuration. For example, we can have a stack in uh, US East 1 and a stack in um, uh, US East 2 or a stack in prod and a stack in staging. But if we want to deploy it to another region, we would just import a different regional configuration file and everything would just continue to work and be ready to be deployed there. Another convention that's become popular is uh, organizing by team. So teams don't want to be overwhelmed with all the unnecessary configuration that don't relate to them. They want to see their services. They want to know what configuration is available to them. So let's organize around teams, perhaps. So a front end team and a back end team and an SRE team is an example. And the front end team has a web service. The back end team has an API service and so forth. And you could imagine there could be dozens of these files or services. And then orgs. This is how it all comes together. These are what we call your top level stacks. An organization would be broken down perhaps by AWS account or by Datadog account or by Akamai uh, you know, organization. And then in there, you can have a hierarchy as well. So a simplified hierarchy here is for AWS, we're operating in US East 1, we have a production stack and we're operating in US East 1 and we have a staging stack. And then those two stacks can import from uh, the catalog of configuration. The next thing is components. So components is how you organize your building blocks, your code. So here we're gonna show uh, in the demo how we have uh, a convention of doing it by tool. So here are a components for Terraform and components for Helm file and components for Packer. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that it's a monorepo pattern. And within that monorepo pattern, you might wanna do some kind of version pinning. We, that's a bigger conversation for another time, but I'm gonna just leave you with this idea where within your components, you can have different uh, you know, physical branches, if you will, of directories that represent different tracks of your components. So you can have a stable track, you can have an edge track, and this is where you could put components uh, that are in various uh, levels of maturity. And then, you know, if you had Helm files or Packer files, they would go following that same convention. So stacks, this is the secret sauce. This is uh, the magic. So when you follow these conventions, every single file that you see here under uh, stacks, these all have the same exact schema. It's just that we're choosing to put different things in different files so that when we wanna combine it all, we can import a baseline, we can import the AWS account, we can import a VPC, we can import an EKS cluster, an RDS cluster. So in just a few lines of code, you get a very powerful environment and then you get to override the settings as needed. So it's very clear what differs between these environments. We support this concept of custom workflows. Like if you wanted to bring up an EKS cluster, you could create a workflow called EKS up and it'll run the Terraform apply and the VPC, the EKS cluster and the ALB controller, for example. Or you can do subcommands, custom subcommands. So this is the idea where you don't want to give your teams like 50 different commands that they have to run. You want to give them, hey, here is our command. Everything you need to do with our infrastructure is described with processes and workflows in this command. So here is an example where let's say you wanted to uh, extend Atmos with a command to generate a graph of uh, a, a given component. So here we define some standardized inputs and then we just run some inline shell. So in this case, uh, running Terraform init and then uh, graph and then uh, running um, dot to translate that, um, that DAG to a, um, a, a graph. So in summary, um, Business needs to capture the processes. Terraform configuration is difficult at scale and uh, Terraform is not enough and Atmos makes that easier. So uh, RB, uh, you wanna take it away? Uh, sure, uh, by the way, I do have a hard stop in 20 minutes, so I'll try to keep it short and sweet. All right. All right. Uh, so uh, can everybody see my screen? Yep. All right, great. So, uh, so here is our uh, our main repo that we kind of dog food our own uh, Atmos command and configurations and everything. And uh, the way we first start 
is with, uh, as Eric already mentioned, uh, the, um, the the stack configurations. So he, he already showed a little bit on how all of that is set up. But if we were to go to say, uh, VPC here and look up YAML, we can see we have a YAML catalog that goes and uh, and and and, set, and sets a number of uh, of input variables. So we have enabled is true. We can set Mac gateway enabled, Mac subnet count, etc. And all of these are uh, are are YAML inputs that get deep merged into Terraform vars, and then these Terraform vars are then fed into the components that. Uh, that Eric mentioned. And the components are Terraform root modules, which a lot of people also know them as Terraform directories where you run your Terraform workflows. And here is your standard Terraform uh, directory with uh, Terraform files, main.tf, outputs, providers, etc. cetera. Um, Eric, did you want me to drill in uh, into well, each of these files like we do with clients? Yeah, we can just show that briefly. I really do want to show it on the command line and what the experience is. Oh, sure. Uh, let me let me jump over to the command line then. So I have a number of commands here where we can test it out. So the first thing we want to do is uh, we we want to basically build this file. Uh, uh, it, it's a Docker file. Uh, we call it geodesic, and it, it's essentially a tool set that keeps everybody's tools exactly the same no matter uh, what kind of computer you're running and all the same versions, such as a Terraform version, InfraCost version, Atmos version, et cetera. And, and it's basically a tool set that uh, nobody can complain, well, you know, uh, it doesn't work on my machine. Why does it work on yours? So it's pretty nifty, geodesic, outside of the, the conversation of today's demo, but very cool. So geodesic is not a requirement. It's just how we we run everything from a toolbox image, and that's why we show this here. And uh, I'm already uh, pre-authenticated through Leap into our uh, SAML identity account. So you can see this green check mark here shows I'm authenticated. I'm going to double check. So we're good. So the first command I want to run is is uh, I, I want to show you the Atmos command here. So this Atmos command, so Atmos is wrapping the Terraform command, right? So we have Atmos Terraform plan, and I want to set this to be the VPC component. And our stack is going to be the root level stack that Eric already mentioned. And I want to show you what Atmos will actually run in the background by feeding it the dash dash dry run. So we can dump out the dry run here, and we can see that it took all of the stack YAML that we've defined and it dumped out all of the, the deep merge Terraform vars and put them in alphabetical order here. So we can see, um, you know, enabled as true flag, we can see the environment, the max subnet count, <clears throat> all the same inputs I just showed. And then it writes all those uh, input uh, files into a TF vars file within that, uh, that, that root component, that root Terraform module. And uh, the next thing it does is we also have, we have, we have some validation set up uh, that Eric already mentioned uh, using OPA. And uh, we generate the, uh, the Terraform backend. We run Terraform init reconfigure because the backend can change depending on uh, what stack we're actually deploying. And, uh, and, and then we change directory. And then finally we select a workspace and that workspace is gonna be equivalent to the root stack. And finally, we run our Terraform plan command, feeding in the Terraform vars file and outputting that into a plan file, which we can then apply. So, uh, so that's the dry run. So we can just see how it all works. So here's an example of an Atmos Terraform plan of the VPC with a root stack. And it's just going to go through all of the, uh, the Terraform commands. And, and it, it kind of shows too, that Atmos is is wrapping vanilla Terraform, wrapping vanilla HCL, and uh, it could easily be taken out or put back in. And if the workspace doesn't exist, it would actually go ahead and create it. 
which is nice too because Terraform doesn't have that out of the box. So you can see here, no changes. Um, uh, one thing I also want to show was uh, uh, Atmos workflows. I don't know if, uh, Eric, if you touched upon workflows, but we also have a concept of being able to string along different components. Uh, a, a lot of times people, people are tempted to put a lot of different resources within uh, the same Terraform directory, such as, you know, uh, bundling an S3 bucket with ElastiCache Redis and with an ECS cluster and, and, and everything. And, uh, and, and you wind up with a Terralit. And uh, uh, just like Eric mentioned, we, we want to be able to split up each of those things into their root level components and then kind of string them together to build something. So I'll, sh I'll show you uh, a, a workflow where we can string together different um, components in order to create a single command to make life a little bit easier. So you don't have to go and deploy you know, 10 different things just to get one thing out the door. So you can see my, uh, the, the workflows uh, can actually be defined in a specific directory. And we're going to define them in stack slash workflows. So if we check out the VPC workflow, we can see here that uh, I've defined a VPC transit gateway EKS workflow. Uh, I'm not very good at naming stuff, so just kept it very simple to the point. And you can see here, I can do a Terraform apply VPC. I can apply the transit gateway spoke because we use a um, we use a hub and spoke method. And uh, finally, uh, deploying a very specific EKS uh, cluster flavor. And the way we do that is using this. So I, I define I define the workflow, which is the same as a workflow name. Dash F is for file, so it finds the VPC.yaml, and then I apply it to a specific stack. And uh, you know, uh, Bob's your uncle, and there it goes. And it's the same thing, right? It's just going to run the Terraform Terraform plan, and as I showed before, this will result in no changes like it did before. But then, uh, if if this was a a net new account, though, you know, if, if I was to copy, say, uh, a Plat UE two sandbox, and I wanted to create a new sandbox account, I could copy and paste that same YAML file over to sandbox two dot YAML, and then I could simply run this workflow against my new account, which would be pretty handy, and uh, and 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 we have a lot of EKS foundational components as well. So to be able to string along the next 16, you know, Helm releases all in Terraform, that would save a lot of time. Any questions before we move on? Uh, one question uh, for me. Um, did you say that um, it has to be a mono repo that stores all these things, or is there a way to make it work with uh, you know, say your root modules all in separate uh, Git repos. Yeah, so we have a couple options for that. So at the heart of it, we fundamentally believe there needs to be a root of your infrastructure, uh, like a foundation. But that doesn't mean that you can't have lots of other infrastructure repositories, depending on what makes sense for you. What we don't really prescribe is like where every single thing you do is a mono repo or sorry, is a individual repo, like one repo for the VPC, one repo for the account, one repo for the EKS cluster, one repo for that isn't really the model that we are optimized for, but it would work with it. What we can show you is how we support a model where you have a centralized repository of uh, your components that they can be pulled in using a component.yaml file. Um, maybe we showed it, that at the end. But that does, to, to add to that, uh, sorry, Eric, yep. I'm adding here. Um, to add to that, that doesn't stop you for you to actually create a, in, in your components folder, you know, my own uh, module and instantiate your module that it comes from another repo using the source from GitHub or whatever and then use it as a component in your mono repo. It, that doesn't stop you there. So it, it, it is a module, it's a Terraform module, so you can instantiate it any way you want it. So almost every one of our AWS components we've published to github.com slash cloud posse slash Terraform AWS dash components. 
uh, under the modules folder here. These are the ones, so this, I think this is kind of like what you're talking about, having the root module somewhere else. And that's what this is doing. It, we, we can pull from Atmos, we can pull down these modules, these root modules. Any, I know the structure doesn't really um, currently work with, um, especially when you're using uh, Terraform modules, but what are your thoughts on using Git sub modules? Oh, yeah. I mean, we we'd entertained that for a while. We've uh, deliberately decided not to use Git sub modules. So what we did was we implemented uh, Go Getter, which allows you to get literally anything from anywhere. And we did that because what will inevitably happen is you need to make some, you sometimes need to make some local modifications. Um, and what we did was we supported this ability of fetching the version of a, of a root module from some other location and vendoring it locally. So we, we've basically taken a vendoring model as it relates to that. Gotcha. Um, with the sub modules, you can never add a file there, modify a file there, which is a nice peace of mind if you just, if you have to make uh, some emergency changes. Um, the other reason we've liked this pattern is it allows teams to diverge for some amount of time. And it's, it, there's a pretty easy path to understanding how uh, you have diverged from an upstream. Um, so this, uh, this is, supports experimentation and uh, things like that. Yep. So I was, I was purely asking the question based on the previous question to just understand your thinking yeah. around potentially um, suggesting sub modules, but I also understand why sub, sub modules are bad and <laughs> not everyone, not everyone um, loves, loves yeah. get, 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 getting deep into sub modules. We also explore using like git sub trees, which uh, eliminates yeah. those problems of sub modules. Um, what we liked also about this approach was just not tethering it to Git, that we supported basically any model uh, by GoGetter. So these could be uh, stored from some central repository that you could fetch uh, via HTTP or uh, otherwise. You could even yeah. from a Docker image artifact. The nice thing that I want to add to that is um, if you do your own uh, module vendoring is you inherently also get the added benefit of um, versioning your own models. So you could have in your stable branch, you could have a known working model, but you could have your edge branch where you yeah. potentially, where you potentially have a not so nice working, but experimental version of your module that you're playing around with but as a different version tag and that doesn't interfere with your um your stable production state at all yeah hey, hey folks uh, uh could, could we could we save some more of the commentary and and questions for the end of the demo is that yeah, possible let's, yeah sure let's just because we're running out of time yeah all right sorry sorry if that sounded a little abrupt <laughs> no uh, worries Okay. All right. Cool. So uh, I'll, I'll try to be as quick as possible. I promise. All right. So here is another command that I want to show. It's the Atmos describe command. This was a command that we really wanted for a long time. And it was basically like, Hey, I have a bunch of YAML now. Uh, and the YAML is being imported from 10 different places. How do I figure out what's happening? How do I get a deep merge? Where's the YAML coming from? And what's the output without having to run a Terraform plan every time to see what the inputs are. So, uh, 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 the Atmos uh, developers have created the uh, describe command, which has been really, really helpful. And we can get, you know, the backend generated. We can get any uh, dependencies that that it has calculated. Uh, the remote state backend. These are all coming from the the YAML. Uh, we use Spacelift, so um, the Spacelift settings also comes in, and of course all of the inputs that I previously showed, and also the defined workspace, which is the Terraform workspace that's calculated by Atmos. And it's not always the root stack. Sometimes it's the root stack dash the uh, the component. Um, 
due to various reasons with metadata, but uh, but but this is this is all pretty handy. And you can also go ahead and actually find out, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you wanted to describe all of your stacks, it would deep merge all of your YAML stacks, and then uh, you could you could then mention like which which uh, particular components that you want. You can even uh, you, you can even drop off the the stack, and it'll bring you it, it'll show you all the places where your VPC component is without having to kind of grep or rip grep or you know Silver Surfer through all of your code. Which is really really handy. Um, another command I want to mention is uh, um, uh, using custom commands. So Atmos actually has uh, uh, an integration with Coria IO App Builder, and uh, we we use the same YAML schema. So if we take a look at the uh, at this very cool um, Atmos uh, YAML file, here you can see this custom command that I wrote up uh, last night just for this demo. Called infra costs, and it's a subcommand that uh, that that we can that we can run here, and it looks like it errored out. But we can take a look, and as soon as I run Atmos, it'll actually read that YAML file. It'll find this new subcommand that I added, get the description, and allow me to run it, which is very very handy. And uh, and and you can see what it's doing here. It's um, it, it has an argument for component. It has a flag for stack. So the same exact Atmos interface. And uh, it, it can go ahead and create environment variables on the fly, and it can run a custom shell script. And this shell, this custom shell script will basically run infra uh, uh, infra cost, which we have uh, which we have stored here. And you can see here it'll grab the base component using Atmos commands, the workspace, the Terraform directory. It'll it, it can create the plan file for you on the fly, and then finally pass in that plan file to get the infra cost. Um, I'm hesitant to rerun this because it just failed. But uh, oh, you know why it failed? Because I'm not on the VPN, and EKS is behind the VPN. So I'll use the VPC, and we can get the infra cost for the VPC. And of course, it fails. All right. Well, <laughs> take, my, take my word for it that it works, but. Uh, but that is a, a a one way to create custom command line uh, subcommands within Atmos, which is pretty handy. Uh, I'm bouncing around a lot here because I only have a minute left. But uh, another thing I wanted to mention was integrations. Very recently, we've come up with integrations for Atlantis, which is really cool. So you can see here, uh, because I don't have Atlantis configured uh, within this repository, I'm actually downloading this uh, raw file that we have as an example that's upstream. So we can take a look at that. And we can see here under integrations, we have this Atlantis integration. If you all are familiar with Atlantis, then you'll, pro you'll probably be familiar with the Atlantis.yaml file and uh, how the config uh, works. We, we've templatized all of that. So we have a config template here, a project template here, a workflow template here. And all of that will magically create the Atlantis.yaml file for each one of your root stacks and your Terraform components. So that is pretty handy. And it's something that's very similar to, um, I think there's like a Terra Grunt YAML Atlantis generator. Atlantis and, config, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and so it's, it's akin to exactly this, except it's built into Atmos and it understands context of Atmos root stacks. So that's going to come in handy. We're hoping to have a PR back to the Atlantis community to help with the documentation for that, but that is still pending. So but we can see here, now that I have that uh, uh, Atmos file downloaded, and, and that Atmos file downloaded is actually going to supplant my existing Atmos.yaml file. So it's kind of handy. So if you want custom Atmos.yaml files, you can actually make it per directory. So. Um, this, this was the uh, Atlantis command. So it's Atmos Atlantis, it generates the repo config. It, it, uh, and then I can pass in my specific template that I want. So I want to use config-1, project-1, workflow-1. And you can see here that I could, I could create different templates too, depending on you know, how I want to set it up. So then we can go ahead and look at the generated Atlantis.yaml and we can see exactly what I have in the YAML. And each one of the projects, 
uh, the directory is set up, uh, the current workspace is calculated, the workflow is set, et cetera. And, it, and that's happening for every single one of our Terraform root modules. And uh, definitely a lot of lines, but uh, uh, it's the same concept with the Terragrunt stuff where in, in uh, the Terragrunt config generator, I think you run it in a pre-workflow so you don't have to commit the file. So uh, it's not something that you should have to commit, you know, with every single change. So that's integrations. And the last thing I wanted to show you folks, I know uh, I'm over a little bit. Um, it's the uh, the OPA stuff, which I think is is very cool. It's a very recent uh, thing that's been added to Atmos, but you know it, it's going to allow for a lot of interesting um, ways to prevent foot guns. So here's an example <laughs> command. Oh, uh, sorry, somebody say something. No, I was just laughing at your uh, definition. <laughs> there is. <laughs> well, that, that's the whole point, right? Uh, yeah, policy yeah, yeah. code will enforce uh, good guardrails, you know? So here's the, the Atmos validate command. So I'm validating the component VPC against this particular stack. And it's validating um, this component using this OPA file. And now this OPA file is actually defined within my stack catalog. So if we go to stacks, catalog, VPC, you can see that under VPC settings, um, right here in validation, we're using OPA schema type. We also support JSON schema, um, but I like Rego more. So I did, I did in Rego. And so here's the schema path and also description. And this description also shows up right here, which is nice because it lets everybody know why it's doing that. And you can even you know add your tickets there if you like to let everybody know. So then we can also take a look at the Rego script, which is going to be in stacks, schemas, OPA, and here it is. So uh, we, we have a custom um, um, OPA package here, which, which again, like understands the Atmos inputs. And the first thing we want to look at is to only apply this for production. So in the Cloud Posse world, uh, the word stage is another word for account. So, uh, or, uh, uh, yeah, very specific account. So in this case, the account is prod, which you can see here. The environment is UE2, and plat, I believe, is the tenant. Um, you don't need to worry about that. And uh, one of the inputs to our VPC is the max subnet count, which we can see from the uh, describe command that I probably bored everybody to death with because I've run it so much. Oh, if we look here, we can see that the max, oh, and that's for sandbox. So we want to do it for prod. And then we can see the max subnet count is three. So what this is going to do is if if um, if the stage, if the stage is is uh, prod and uh, the max subnet count is less than three, then this message will say all prod VPCs must have at least three subnets, you know, for whatever reason. And so if we run this validate command now, it works fine. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and update this VPC and I'll go ahead and change this to, um, I don't know, zero. And then we'll run the validate again. And now it fails and it shows exactly the error message that I wanted it to show. So there's there's a lot more we could do with that um, and a lot more we can explore. All right, thank you uh, so much, RB. I know you got a drop, so uh, good good job on the demo. And um, I can stick around for another minute to see if there's any questions. Cool, thanks all, take it easy. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, any questions um, on what you've just seen? Um, I have a number of questions actually, this is Oliver. Um, but I don't know if there's time to answer them today in relation to Atmos. It's certainly very enticing. And, uh, you know, the uh, one thing that I would need as a potential end user is, is to know things like, OK, like uh, what where is a getting started with Atmos? Right? When I, where can I find that? Uh, I mean, I have existing projects with with some customers that I, I could see. Yeah, maybe maybe that would you know be a shortcut to save me from having to reinvent the wheels for for obvious uh, reasons, there there's some overlap, but until uh, the you know until the rubber hits the road, I, I don't know whether you know if I if there's certain things that it can't do or don't fit with what my customer yeah. wants. 
uh, how much work is it to do that? Is it something that I could propose as a PR or does it, does it have to be done, you know, modified by you guys? Those are all concerns that I would have as potential end user and would be good to discuss maybe, maybe in the next uh, uh, yeah. weekly or something. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's uh, let's uh, bring that up in the next call. Also, just a heads up, the tutorials were updated in the last week. Uh, they were broken, um, embarrassingly enough, but Dan, uh, Dan Miller on the team just updated all the tutorials that we have, so they should be working. Uh, so github.com slash cloud posse slash tutorials. All right, any other questions? Would those tutorials feed to the to your website? Because I think I found some of the tutorials on your website within this week that were still broken. But yeah, I'll on your GitHub. yeah, the tutorials on docs.cloudposse.com are probably not updated yet. Uh, but the tutorials in the GitHub repository themselves are updated and validated to be working. Awesome. Um, they don't, but be advised, like one of the things that we don't do in our tutorials is uh, they're, they're trying to show the basics of how the tool works with imports and so forth. Uh, like our private repository here, they don't lay out like an advanced uh, full on AWS architecture um, that's outside of the scope of the tutorials uh, right now. Also, I think that Alan, you had asked kind of what our org structure was, um, and this was it right here. So basically orgs, uh, CP Live, then under that your organizational units, and then underneath the organizational units, the accounts. Yeah. And the accounts. Oh, would be I think you're, you're not sharing, Eric. Ah! Go figure, I always do that. Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, here we see that uh, orgs, under orgs, all your organizations, under organizations, the OUs, under OUs, the accounts, and under accounts, the regions and resources. Awesome. Um, I was going to say. That, that's also not prescriptive. You can, that's just yeah. kind of our best practice. You can organize it however you want. Yeah. Any yeah no, I've, I've got someone who's got like a ton of accounts that wants to, that, that's just badly designed. So I was going to just reference your model for just, okay, let's just rename some of them and let's put like a master account in place and like add all the other accounts in the specific structure that meets like that LDAP OU type structure. And I just wanted to get some reference material because I do think that your reference material for that was quite good. I just couldn't find yeah, that page was not public, to be honest. So that's part of our private customer documentation as part of our reference architecture. So yeah. uh, we make that available to all the customers uh, that go through the accelerator program. Awesome. Just adding one two, quick two cents thing is that uh, that's not necessarily LDAP OU. That's actually corresponding. The way we do it is we correspond to the AWS organization organizational structure. Um, for AWS oriented uh, accounts. So those are actually the, the OUs that are defined within the AWS organization. And then all the accounts yeah. that are underneath that, et cetera, and following it down. So gotcha. that, that's where that structure came from. It, it mirrors the AWS organization exactly. So yeah. CP Live in that example was the AWS organization. And then all those things underneath it were the OUs and then the accounts underneath all those OUs. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, I'm gonna push pause on this right now. Uh, if you have questions, please share them in the Office Hours channel or come back next week on Wednesday. Uh, happy to answer any other questions there and uh, go into details. Uh, we'll post a recording of the session today to the YouTube channel in a few hours. Uh, if you haven't already, go to youtube.com slash cloud posse to subscribe. If you wanna connect with me, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash in slash Osterman and connect. If you are interested in how we can accelerate DevOps at your organization uh, by hiring Cloud Posse, go to cloudposse.com slash quiz, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, see how we can help you out. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. So, cheers.